Julia, the floor is yours. Give her a warm applause. Hello. Well, Job took most of my intro there. So, diversity, the dreaded D word. Yeah, lots of white men. Welcome to IT. Uh, it's better. Uh, I was stood in the queue this morning. I tweeted, there are six women in the queue in front of me. Am I in the right place? I came here two years ago. There were about five or six of us in total. This year, I've counted 12 unique women, but I think I may have missed some. So, diverse teams. There's no contest. Diverse teams are better teams. If anyone wants to argue about this outside afterwards, quite happy to. <laughs> so, what happens if we don't have a diverse team? Does anyone remember the video from the soap dispensers that were fitted at Facebook? The racist ones. They could detect a white hand and would dump soap out. But if you were a person of color, nah, -uh, no clean hands for you. If you had had a single non-white person on that team, that would have been picked up before you deployed. Apple, on their iPhone, they issued a comprehensive health tracker. This could track everything your calorie intake, the level of copper in your blood. But it couldn't track your menstrual cycle. Women are just over 50% of the world's population. The world's largest phone manufacturer didn't think to include a menstrual cycle tracker. Google trained an AI network to recognize your photos and categorize them. A developer opened this up, loaded their family pictures, and discovered that his entire family had been classified as gorillas. Guess what color that person was? What's worse is Google's fix for this. They just removed the possibility to classify things as gorillas. They didn't you know, fix the neural network. They just removed that as an option because that was easier. And then Amazon. They trained an AI to filter their CVs, or resumes as you might call them, for job applications. What data did they use? The data that was the CVs of everyone that had been successful. They trained their network to find more people like them. They've trained it to find more white blokes. If they'd thought about this, if they'd had a diverse team in the first place, it wouldn't have happened. These are just four examples. I could have picked thousands. I mean, even simple stuff, the seatbelt. Not a single woman involved in the team that designed the three-point seatbelt that is in every single car. The result of which is that in the case of an accident, pregnant people have a much higher chance of injury than men. A single woman on the team would have picked that up. So, how do we fix this? Well, we need to be aware that we've got a problem. It's 2019, we're kind of doing that. So, it starts with recruitment. Uh, anyone here recently started looking for a job? Anyone gone through the job adverts? Really? You're all that happy? Hmm? Oh yeah, good point. <laughs> so, job ads. Everyone here is unique. Okay, I was expecting someone to yell, I'm not, but okay. Um, so, if you have a single advert tailed to a single person, or a single type of person, you're gonna get that type of person. So, I want to introduce you to some amazing people that inspire me. Now, this is Lael Wilcox. She raced across America in the Trans Am bike race, a 6,500 kilometer, non-stop, self-supported bike race. And she won, much to the surprise of everybody watching and all of the men that she beat. 
At this point, people woke up and went, hold on, maybe, maybe women are good. That was 2016. A few months later, there was an event in Australia called the Race to the Rock. 3,000 kilometers from the edge of Australia to Uluru in the middle. Non-stop, self-supported, mostly off-road. 13 people started. Sarah Hammond finished. It became known as the race so hard, no man has even finished it. <laughs> the following year, she came back. Nine people started. Sarah won. Again, 650 kilometers ahead of second place. But a man did finish, so now it's the race so hard no man has ever won it. She came back for the third year just to prove a point. So far, the race has won three times, and she's the only person that's won it. This year's race starts tomorrow. Sarah's not racing. And then one from this year. This is Fiona Kolbinger. She made CNN. BBC, Guardian, Telegraph, various other major news outlets, because she won the 4,000 kilometer transcontinental bike race. She beat 225 men and 39 women, including myself, to race 4,000 kilometers from the Black Sea to the Atlantic in 10 days, two hours, 58 minutes. She beat all the men. So, why am I telling you this? It's because when you start to change the conditions by which you judge people, you start to see different results. Women aren't going to win the 100 meter sprint. We're probably not going to win the marathon. But when you double it, when you go from a marathon to 50 kilometers, you get people like Ellie Pell. Sorry. Yeah, Ellie Pell who recently won an ultramarathon in the US and got given the first place trophy and the first place women's trophy. And the first place man didn't get anything because they hadn't envisaged that as an option. <laughs> Yasmin Paris won the 430 kilometer spine race while stopping along the way to express milk for her newborn child. When the conditions change, you can start to get different winners. Or to put it another way, you can't judge a fish by its inability to climb a tree. So, what do we do? It starts with your job advert. Now, those of you on IRC yesterday will have noticed me bitching and moaning about two adverts in particular. One said, do you feel like a king in your field? Just like, nope, never felt like a king. Honestly, don't think so. Another one from the same recruitment agency. Could you be our next Linux man? Uh, no, not without surgery. You then get to the, the actual nitty gritty of the adverts and a lot of them will list 20 different protocols or pieces of software or things that would be nice to have. Men will apply for that advert if they meet about 60% of those requirements. Women apply when they meet 100. If we don't care about most of those, why put them in the advert? You're just turning women away. So, your ideal job advert for the role of network engineer. You want someone with a reasonable level of technical knowledge, bachelor's degree, or equivalent experience. If you insist on having a degree, you'll get the people that go to university and only them. Look for equivalent experience. Look for the people that started work straight from the age of 16 or 18 in this country. Look for the people that have learned the hard way. You want someone who can communicate well. Pretty obvious, we're a communications industry. You want some basic knowledge and experience as a network engineer? And you want them to be a team player. The first draft of this slide said, not an asshole. It's basically what you're saying. You don't need to list that you want them to know Cisco and Juniper and Arista and BGP and TCP IP and CCNA and you've lost track now. It's not there. 
You just want to have a nice, simple advert. Otherwise, you're disadvantaging women. So, your advert. Next up, we come to the interview. Anyone here enjoy job interviews? I know the number of a good therapist. <laughs> so, not everyone can make the times that you might originally offer. Not everyone can get out of the horrible job they're doing now to get to your nine o'clock Monday morning interview. Offer them potentially the option of an evening. Yes, you're gonna have to work late one night, but it means that you might get that amazing engineer that couldn't come in during the day. Think about your venue. Is it accessible? Don't put the people applying for your job in the position where they have to ask, is there a ramp for my wheelchair? Declare that. Make it obvious to people. Then think about the questions you're asking. Anyone here in an interview had the question, what's your biggest flaw? How many of you answered it honestly? Again, with the therapist. <laughs> if no one's going to answer it honestly, why bother asking it at all? It's just there to make them squirm. The best interview question I've ever had, two years ago, 2017, someone asked, where do you see yourself in three years' time? Because it got me the opportunity to say, I don't know, I don't have 2020 vision. <laughs> and then we get to my biggest pet hate of all, whiteboarding, which for some might actually, waterboarding would be preferable. It, whiteboarding, for those that don't know, is the act of giving somebody a question, giving them a whiteboard marker, and getting them to stand up and give their answer on the whiteboard. For many people, women in particular, that is their biggest fear. As a culture, we bring our women up to not put your hand up, to not stand in front of the audience and so then we get them to an interview and that's what we ask them to do. It doesn't work. Stop doing it. This is the point where someone usually says, oh, what should we do instead? Sit down with a pad of paper and a pen. Do it politely and kindly next to each other. Don't put them on the pedestal. So, you've done a job advert. You've put them through their... Uh, interviews, comes the offer. Do so in a reasonable time period. Don't leave people waiting because they might look for somewhere else. And for every candidate, tell them why they didn't get the job. That's just plain politeness. So, fantastic. You've hired your first woman to the team. Congratulations. And yes, for a lot of companies, it really is that bad. The thing is, and I've spoken to a lot of companies about this. They say, we like hiring women, but none of them stay around any long. Oh, dear God. Time to fix your processes. So, let's start with the simple one. Equal pay for equal work. Doesn't matter whether you've got testicles or something else. Pay the same. If the job title is the same, pay the same. To enforce this, have pay transparency. You don't have to list every single person's pay. You can say, we have X number of employees that earn between 3,000 3, and 3,500. We have X that earn between 3,500 and 4,000, et cetera, et cetera. But be transparent. A lot of the cases, women don't know that they are being underpaid until they discover usually by mistake, how much the men are getting. One of the age-old arguments for why we shouldn't hire women is apparently we have a habit of going off and making babies. The issue here isn't that women go off and have babies. 
The issue here is that men and fathers are not taking their parental leave and parental responsibilities right. Yes, I am standing in a full room full of men and saying, be better fathers. Again, it's not what you want to hear. The EU is coming to our aid on this. Laws will be coming into effect in the next year or two, which increase the amount of paternity leave that men are offered. Take it. If your company offers better maternity leave, equal the paternity leave. It removes the argument. Finally, we touched on this earlier. The 40-hour working week is an anachronism from when you had a housewife at home to look after your house, to do your ironing, cleaning, etc. Doesn't work for everyone. It's 2019. Offer flexible working hours. Offer reduced working hours. No one needs to work 40 hours. 32 is enough. So, what about the working environment? I spoke to the organiser of a Dutch tech conference and said, you had no women speaking at your conference this year. His response was, well, no females applied. We don't know how to get more females to apply. My response was, well, for starters, don't call us females. You sound like a Ferengi. The word you're looking for is woman. And before anyone complains, the same is true in Dutch, though I'm not going to do comedy by trying to pronounce it. So, avoid using females. The word you're looking for is woman. Next up, guys is not a gender neutral term. There's an easy way to determine this. How many guys have you dated? The other option is to ask everybody to draw a guy. Most people will draw a man. Guys is not gender neutral. Don't walk into the office and say, hello guys. Go for something else. Colleagues, team, minions, anything. <laughs> when you write your documentation, avoid using the default male. Don't use he or him everywhere. Either mix it up or just write it as gender neutral. You don't need to have it in there. And then also, be aware of your linguistic bias. I have been called scary. I have been called formidable. And I have been called intimidating. These days, I wear them as a badge of honor. But when you're in your 20s, and that's what they put on your appraisal at work, it's not good. Think about the language you are using. Women are called bossy. The same behavior from men is called assertive. Why? So, what about the rest of our working environment? Look out for microaggressions from some of your employees. And then take a zero tolerance policy. You need to make sure that you don't have the, but that engineer is too good. He's worth 10 of the rest of you. We can't get rid of them. We know they're an asshole. We know they're driving all the women away. We know they're racist. Get rid of them. They are not good for your company. They are not good for your culture. It is better to hire 10 slightly worse engineers than accept the one asshole. And apart from anything else, it's a single point of failure. They might get hit by a bus. Seriously, if you're not planning in your company for what happens if your employees are hit by a bus or a similar thing, you're not taking uh, disaster recovery and disaster planning properly. So, the other thing there is avoid tokenism. This is difficult at the start because initially you will have the one woman the one person of colour. But ideally, you want to be in a position where you have more. That way, it's not a question of it's come from the woman. 
in the team. It's that crazy Brits at it again. Believe your employees when they say that the, something is not good. When they say that their colleague said something homophobic or sexist, believe them. Deal with it. Don't let it fester. We've all seen in the news the situations with Me Too. Don't let that happen to your company. This also is going to require buy-in from your management. Right the way, all the way to the top. All levels. That's where layer nine comes in. Oh, and monitor your churn rate. Come back to the thing of, hold on, wait a minute. We've hired 10 women, but none of them have lasted more than six months. Why? What are we doing wrong? If you don't have the data and you don't sexually disaggregate the data, you can't monitor it. Check your SLI, check your SLO. And once you've started doing this, recurse. You need to get involved at the start of the pipeline. Get involved in outreach with education, internships, work experience, bring your daughter to work day, all of these things. Just make sure you pay your interns. Deal with graduate schemes. Get involved in hackathons, community events, and celebrate your successes. Celebrate the successes of people in our industry. Hands up here if you know who Sophie Wilson is. One of you, two of you. Hands up if you have a smartphone in your pocket. Every single one of you is using a chip Sophie Wilson designed. She designed the ARM processor. Hands up if you know who Hedy Lamar is. Slightly, few, uh, slightly more. She invented frequency hopping spread spectrum, which is what Wi-Fi uses. This year has been the 50th anniversary of Apollo. We talk about Aldrin. We talk about Armstrong. Some people even talk about Margaret Hamilton. Everyone know who Margaret Hamilton was? She wrote the software for the lander. The person very few people are talking about is Joanne Morgan. She was the only woman in the launch control control room during the launch. The only one in a sea of men. The pictures look really disturbing and anachronistic now. Celebrate our successes. So, now I've told you everything you're doing wrong. Any questions? Before we, before we kick off with questions, I would like to extend a, a compliment to you because um, uh, it's quite easy in, in topics like these to, to, to sneak into stereotypes or, or use hyperboles, and I uh, thought you uh, did a magnificent job of uh, broadening my perspective, and that was what I was hoping for, but it's very cool that it um, happens. So, thank you. No problem. Hello. Uh, so one thing that I've noticed, especially in the last five, ten years, is that diversity, the term, seems to be used as a metric that people look at and say, what are we like today? And they never think about how to fix it in the future, which is why this term inclusivity, to make sure that people aren't excluded, is quite important in my view. But for those of us who are either hiring managers or have sweaty with hiring managers, what would you say is the number one key thing that you can influence somebody to do to increase the diversity of our workforce? Be diverse in the first place. And if that's not already the case? I never said it was easy. I know. <laughs> um, what's the one thing to do to begin with? Simplify your hiring. Simplify the, the job applications. Uh, because you need to get them in the door. Um, yeah, deal with that, that side of things and then try and keep them there. Couldn't agree more. Thank you. Seriously? No more questions?
Oh. I hope I'm not too short for this one. It um, does move down. Yeah, I figured that out. Um, a bit of a different question, but why do you think, at least in my experience, I've noticed that women don't have interest in IT? Why do you think that is? Because we're told not to. By whom? Society. Okay. <laughs> can, I just, ooh, hello. can I just add something on that, which is that uh, as somebody with a sister who is 12, nearly 13, uh, she was massively into IT. She was into computing, into maths, into physics. And I thought this was a solved problem. We, we do wise in the UK, women in science education or whatever. And when young girls especially, 12, 13, 14, they get into that kind of what we call secondary school in the UK, they get dissuaded so much. They get forced to, to other kind of things. Still science subjects maybe, maybe biology, chemistry, geography, but they get steered away from IT because it's seen as a boys' club. And it's very much a boys' club. Even today, I would have thought we'd have changed in the last 20, 30 years. So just from personal experience, it's, it's got to start when people are at school. Because on my course doing computer science, there was maybe only 10% that were female. Women, rather, sorry. 10%? 10%. Luxury. When it, I went to university back at the turn of the century, on a computer systems engineering degree, there were 53 people on that course. Anyone want to guess the total number of women? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> but we have, to, we have to make sure that those numbers, it, it, it's roughly equal when you look at somebody who is maybe eight, nine, 10 years old, but people are dissuaded at that young age. And we need to make sure that those people aren't dissuaded. And it's not just women, it's other people as well, but women in particular need to be encouraged and it's our responsibility, not just as, uh, as mothers and fathers and whatever, but as IT professionals, we need to make sure that everybody is included. It's really important. There was a, a situation in the UK uh, a few months back. A school was doing a careers event and they had various people from various careers come in to do events and activities with the kids. And each kid could sign up for what they wanted to do. And one of the girls signed up for the engineer session. She gets to the classroom, finds all the seats are taken, asks the teacher, but I signed up for this. The teacher says, yeah, I took you off the list and made space for a boy. It's 2019. And that's what's going on in our schools. We need to be better at this. Thanks. I concur. The school stuff. Uh, I was 16. Uh, informatics. Informatica, when you're 16 at a high school. Awful. My computer crashed three times uh, on some text editor or something. And then the teacher told me, you know what, give me 20 guilders and you can skip the classes because you're never going to get computers anyway. Um, so I did. And uh, I, was, I was glad I got rid of that stupid computer. Um, and later on, by accident, I stumbled into IT, um, really at the bottom, just help desking, customer service. Um, and at some point, I was a network engineer, junior network engineer, uh, and I'm not today anymore. Um, and I would say 25% of the reason, maybe more, secretly, and I don't dare to admit that yet, is because of harassment that I quit working in a NOC. And, um, and that was the Netherlands. And that was just amongst, um, yeah, former uh, NL NOC crew, I would even say. So um, when we get the question, why are there no, no girls in IT? I know where, why there are no girls in IT. Why, in the first place, they don't get to IT. But then, once they work in IT, I also saw what could possibly go wrong. And, um, and it's not pretty, but a lot of the guys are just simply not aware because they don't, they don't experience it. I mean, it happens very much under the surface, often. And it's not very visible or it's perceived as a joke. And yeah, for 20 years I didn't say anything and I'm kind of done with not saying anything anymore because it's 2019 and I think it's uh, time we, we deal with this.
couldn't say it better. We, we, need to, we really need to have a complete zero tolerance policy to it. That includes people witnessing it. You have to be better allies. This was a discussion at the uh, Women in Tech lunch at Ripe 77, I think it was, the one in Amsterdam. How to be a better ally. If you're not an ally, you're against us. It's that simple. Or an arsehole, whichever term you prefer. Be better. Thank you. Julia, thank you for your insights. This was wonderful.